Complications in Early Pregnancy Part 1 The two commonest complaints in early pregnancy are bleeding and vomiting in pregnancy. In Part 1 of this series of presentations, we will focus on bleeding in early pregnancy and in particular the approach to spontaneous abortions in pregnancy. The learning objectives are to learn to diagnose and assess the severity of common complications in early pregnancy, to provide a list of differential diagnoses for common complaints in early pregnancy, and to learn to manage these complications in early pregnancy. Vaginal bleeding is common in the first trimester up to 13 plus 6 weeks, occurring in 20 to 40 percent of pregnancies. Bleeding can be any combination of light or heavy, intermittent or constant, painless or painful. The five major sources of non-traumatic bleeding in early pregnancy are ectopic pregnancy, early pregnancy loss, threatened abortion, implantation of pregnancy, and cervical, vaginal, or uterine pathology. Bleeding due to early pregnancy loss or threatened abortion is the most common cause, and majority of patients remain hemodynamically stable with only 1% of expectantly managed patients requiring blood transfusion. In any approach, we will start with history taking, followed by a physical examination as part of the clinical evaluation. History taking. It is important to take a basic menstrual history. The last menstrual period and the irregularity of the patient's menstrual cycle may give a clue to the gestation of the pregnancy. Next, the details of the pervaginal bleeding is important. The amount of bleeding, the onset, as well as symptoms of anemia such as postural giddiness, palpitations, syncope, exertional dyspnea are important if excessive bleeding resulting in anemia is suspected. Commonly associated symptoms such as lower abdominal cramps, passage of products of conception, foul-smelling pervaginal discharge, fever, or pronounced symptoms of early pregnancy such as excessive nausea and vomiting. Additionally, a basic menstrual history should be taken. The last menstrual period and the regularity of the patient's menstrual cycle, which may give a clue to the gestation of the pregnancy. An obstetric history should also be taken as it can influence current pregnancy. This includes details such as history of previous early pregnancy losses or conditions associated with early pregnancy loss, as well as previous C-sections. Other details regarding current pregnancy should be elicited such as use of assisted reproductive technologies and position of placenta. Following this, a thorough physical examination should be performed. Vital parameters should be charted, looking out specifically for signs of hemodynamic instability. An abdominal and internal pelvic examination should be performed. Any tissue the patient has passed should also be examined. The abdomen should be palpated, especially if the patient complains of abdominal pain, assessing for evidence of acute abdomen, involuntary guarding, and rebound tenderness. A handheld Doppler ultrasound can be used to check the fetal heartbeat if pregnancy is at or beyond 10 to 12 weeks of gestation. The patient is then placed in the lithotomy position and an internal pelvic examination is performed. The clinician should determine whether uterine size is appropriate for estimated gestational age. A speculant examination is performed to assess the amount of pervaginal bleeding, whether the cervical os is open or closed, presence of products of conception, or foul-smelling discharge. Vaginal examination may detect adnixal tenderness or masses, or cervical excitation. Next, certain specific investigations should be performed to elucidate the etiologies of the bleeding. Serum beta-ACG. Serum beta-ACG classically doubles every 48 hours in a normal pregnancy. If the serum beta-ACG level is falling instead of rising, this likely indicates a spontaneous abortion or miscarriage. Conversely, if the increase in serum beta-ACG is less than 66% within 48 hours, suspicion of ectopic pregnancy should be entertained. If the serum beta-HCG is 50,000 or higher, Gestational tropoblastic disease should now be suspected. Transvaginal ultrasonography is the cornerstone of evaluation of bleeding in early pregnancy. Features to look out for include a gestational sac. This may be intrauterine within the uterus or extrauterine outside the uterus. 
This can be seen as early as 5 weeks gestation and usually when the serum beta ECG is above 1500 via a transvaginal ultrasound of the pelvis. A double deciduous sign indicates an intrauterine pregnancy. In general, the rate of increase of the gestational sac size is 1.2 millimeters per day. Yolk sac. The yolk sac is usually visualized within 5 to 6 weeks gestation and disappears by 10 weeks gestation. A blighted ovium is diagnosed when the gestational sac is more than 25 millimeters, but there is no yolk sac. A miscarriage is diagnosed when the crown rump length is more than 7 millimeters without fetal cardiac activity. If a miscarriage is diagnosed, identification of remnant products of conception and thickness of endometrium are necessary. If an ectopic pregnancy is suspected, efforts should be made to look for agnesal masses or free fluid within the pouch of Douglas. The absence of an intrauterine gestational sac is highly suggestive of ectopic pregnancy. If more than six weeks have lapsed since first day of patient's last menstrual period. If a gestational tropovastic disease is suspected, the classical image of a cystic snowstorm appearance should be evident. In the event transvaginal ultrasound is not readily available to assess the uterus, transabdominal ultrasound can be used. MRI is rarely indicated but may be used as second-line imaging modality for further evaluation of limited and non-diagnostic ultrasound. Now we shall discuss the different types of spontaneous abortions and the appropriate approach. Spontaneous abortion or miscarriage is defined as a non-viable intrauterine pregnancy up to 20 weeks of gestation. A threatened miscarriage is diagnosed when the patient presents with pervaginal staining, usually without abdominal pain, but on examination of the cervix, it is closed and the scan shows fetal cardiac activity. An incomplete miscarriage is when the patient has pervaginal bleeding associated with lower abdominal cramps and sometimes even passage of products of conception. On examination, the cervical os is open with products of conception seen and the scan shows no fetal cardiac activity with an irregular gestational sac or remnants products of conception. A complete miscarriage may present similar to that of an incomplete miscarriage, but on examination, the cervical os is closed and the scan shows an empty uterus. An inevitable miscarriage is diagnosed when the fetal heart is still present on performing a scan, but the cervix is open. Patients with missed miscarriage usually present with pervaginal staining, rarely lower abdominal cramps, but no passage of products of conception. On examination, the cervix is closed, and on scanning, there are products of conception, but no evident fetal cardiac activity. Lastly, a septic miscarriage is suspected when the patient complains of fever, foul-smelling discharge, and in addition to the above symptoms, physical examination findings reflect a septic state. Management of a spontaneous abortion. Expectant treatment with duration should be offered in a threatened miscarriage. If fetal cardiac activity is present, 97% of patients will have normal outcomes. There is no evidence to support restriction of physical activity or progestogenic support. If there are no further episodes of pervaginal bleeding, a repeat scan may be performed in a week's time for reassessment of fetal viability. In a complete miscarriage, an ultrasound should be performed to identify if there are remnant products of conception and the endometrial thickness measured. If the endometrial thickness is less than 15 millimeters, the option for conservative management may be offered. This includes watchful waiting for pregnancy tissue to pass on its own or use of medication such as combined mefepristone and misoprostol regimen. If the patient is septic, broad-spectrum antimicrobial agents should be commenced and cultures obtained with subsequent conversion to specific antimicrobial agents. The patient should be stabilized and a surgical evacuation of uterus should be performed to eradicate the nidus of infection. In a diagnosed incomplete miscarriage, we need to ensure that the patient is hemodynamically stable and subsequently proceed with an evacuation of the uterus. In inevitable or missed miscarriage, all three management options are possible. This includes expectant management via spontaneous expulsion of remnant products of conception, medical treatment with oral misoprostol, and surgical evacuation of uterus via DNC. In all cases, pain management with NSAIDs should be conducted as there can be significant uterine cramping. 
for patients who opt for conservative management, follow-up and confirmation of complete passage of gestational tissue is required. Complications such as incomplete uterine emptying, infection, bleeding, and disseminated intravascular coagulation should be monitored. Quiz time. Question 1. A patient presents with pervaginal bleeding, abdominal pain, and passing of products of conception. On speculum examination, the oz is open and remnant of products of conception seen in the vaginal vault. What type of miscarriage is this? The answer is B. Incomplete miscarriage. Question 2. Which of the following is not a major source of non-traumatic bleeding in early pregnancy? The answer is C. Anal fissure. Question 3. Which of the following is first-line management in patients presenting with septic miscarriage? The answer is D. Surgical evacuation of uterus.